Hello, everyone. Welcome to Something to Talk About Live and happy Thursday. Uh, my name is Jamie Hinkle. I'm the Learning and Inclusion Manager at PFLAG National, and my pronouns are she and her. Uh, just like every week, um, I, it's going to be quick and easy. I'm going to bring Jean Marie Nevetta in to lead today's conversation. Hello, Jamie Hinkle. How's it going? Good, good. Did you notice my haircut from? I Baltimore? did. I did. I think this is the first time that people are seeing it. I love it. I think it's so much fun. Yeah, yeah. It's it's been much cooler than it was previously. So was it a big life change decision. Like I've survived a chunk of COVID. It's time to change it up. Yeah, so something like that. I mean, I think that it was really that I felt like I could go to a salon and it wouldn't be the end of the world. Um, so maybe it was a bit of both. But um, our realities have shifted. <laughs> a great conversation ready to go. Um, and so I will let you take it away. I will see you a little bit later, Jamie. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Something to Talk About Live. My name is Jean Marie Nevetta. My pronouns are she or ella. Um, and every single week we get together to talk about something relevant to the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and this week we have a really interesting conversation. Um, and it is about uh, the generational wealth gap. And so if you don't know what this is, we have a fantastic article that we have posted um, today that appeared in Pride Source um, that was entitled The LGBTQ Generational Wealth Gap is a Serious Issue. If you're queer, here's why you should be concerned. But of course, because we are PFLAG, we think that everyone should be paying attention and concerned. And when we're talking about generational wealth, we are talking about um, the economics of money, which in different ways gets passed down through generations and families and who gets it. And in this case, who doesn't get it and what it what the impact of that actually is. And to talk about this, we actually are going to go through personal story um, and look at it kind of in a different way. And for that, um, we have another, I'm very proud to say, person from New Jersey um, along uh, with us today. And I'd love to bring in today's guest, um, Mark Travis Rivera. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Jean Marie, thank you for having me. Thank you for that oh. wonderful time. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really, really excited. So very quickly, I mean, I was, you know, as I read your biography, I felt, as I often do, very unaccomplished. Um, you are a storyteller, you're a writer, you're a choreographer, you're a performer, and, and I'm going to read this, you are the youngest person found uh, to found an integrated dance company in the United States, which is the Marked Dance Project, which you founded in March of 2009. So could you just tell people a tiny bit about yourself so they have an understanding of where you're coming from and how we're getting into this conversation? Sure. Thank you. Um, my name is Mark Charles Rivera. My pronouns are he, him, or él. Um, I love that you added that, so I'm going to steal that from now on. Um, my physical description is that I am a tan or bronze makeup uh, short black hair with a blue hat, black glasses, a scarf, and a white shirt. That's my visual description for those who may be visually impaired or, or, or blind. And I uh, grew up in New Jersey, Patterson, New Jersey, which is the third largest city in the state of New Jersey, um, in a single mother household, uh, Latino, Puerto Rican descent. And I started my dance company when I was 17 years old because as a disabled person, there was no dance opportunity for me in the state of New Jersey. So I created my own. Um, that took me on a wild ride for 10 years. Uh, and it culminated in 2019 with a big show in New York City. And so I've traveled the country talking at Harvard, MIT, I've done a TEDx talk. Uh, I've dubbed myself a professional storyteller because everything I do at the core of what I do is about storytelling. And that's about human connection and about telling our truth and living authentically. So that's a little bit about me. I'm so excited to be a part of this conversation today. Um, I'm a big fan of PFLAG and all that you all do to make families better and transform the meaning of love and family. So thank you for having me. Thank you. And now I have, we have a Boricua co connection too. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, you know, today we're talking about generational wealth gap, and this is something you have definitely experienced um, on a number of different levels um, doing what you have done. And, you know, there is this stereotype of the wealthy gay couple with no children, a whole lot of disposable income. Um, and it, you know, that they're just, rolling in money. Um, and a lot of people have sort of bought into this thing. And it's actually not really true. I mean, if we look at statistics, we know, um, according to uh, uh, a lot of research, um, when it comes to LGBTQ people, about uh, somewhere in the area of about 60% in some of the demographics are people who are raising children. And when it comes to poverty, about 21% of our community lives in poverty when the national average at the time of a survey that we were looking at was about 15%. So 
why do you think, and, and you know, as a person of color, you've definitely seen this. Why do you think that myth of, you know, the, the wealthy um, queer person is so, so prevalent? What's behind it? I think media representation is a big part of it. You know, I grew up studying communication and mass media. I learned how to tell stories by watching television, by watching the Oprah Winfrey talk show, um, the Oprah Winfrey show. And what I always saw in television at the time growing up, and in this is in the early 90s, mid 90s, uh, was that we had a very affluent businessman who happened to be queer or gay or bisexual or, you know, somewhere on the spectrum. And more often than not, they were white, right? And so I think when we talk about the wealth gap, and I think this article touches upon it, but there is, um, I think, can be more intentional intersectionality brought into it. And so when we talk about white people in America, they while they make up the majority of those who use welfare benefits and and are living in poverty um when we talk about them those who are billionaires or millionaires or those who inherit wealth they tend to be white and so we have to think about this not just from a sexuality and gender perspective but from a race perspective because there is no talking about financial literacy or financial wellness or financial wealth gaps without talking about race and class yeah. right um for many lgbtq youth um that experience high family rejection rates after coming out of the closet or inviting them into their truth. Uh, we know that they experience homelessness. We know they've been housing insecurity, food insecurity. And because of that, they're already at a disadvantage in their lives, right? How does a 17 year old know how to budget or plan for a job when they don't have a roof over their head, right? And as a person of color who's queer, it's compounded by race, sexuality, and gender, yes. right? And so we know that because of slavery, because of racism in this country, in America, in this capitalist society, we know that people of color were prohibited from owning property, from voting for a very long time. Um, so there's all these things that tie back to our origin stories of where we come from, right? And innately, when we talk about finances in this country, it's to talk about racism. Yeah. There's no separating that. And yeah. so I think that this article is very interesting. It brought up some really great points, but the myth of why the misconception is there, I think has to do with the media representation. And yeah. it is true that there are white gay men who because of patriarchy, because of white privilege, um, despite their sexuality or gender identity, have been able to rise above the norm or the standard of what we all go through, right? But for those who are most marginalized, black trans women and brown trans women who are queer or, or on the trans spectrum, uh, we know that they experience higher rates of violence, higher rates of just employment discrimination and job loss. And so we have to look at this from an intersectional perspective, not just from a one end perspective. Yeah, and I, I, I so appreciate you saying that because I think right exactly where you started watching television, what did you see? You did not see people who looked like you. Um, and that created a model of sort of what the expectation was going to be. What do you think we can do? And I think you talking about this is, is already getting to it. But what can we do to change that perception? Because it is still really strong. It's gotten a little bit better. But if you look out there, it's, we've still got a long way to go when it comes to portraying who our community really is. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, you know, it starts by telling your story. You know, I think everyone feels like their story is not unique or their story doesn't matter. Uh, because of where they come from or where, how they were raised to believe about themselves. But every story matters. And every story has the power to shift minds, change perceptions, and make the world a better place. And so I always encourage people, tell your story. Maybe you don't have a big stage or a big microphone, but one story can change one life, and that one life can inspire someone else to tell their story and then change another life. And so it becomes this ripple effect, right? So tell your story. Tell your experiences as you know it, because if you don't tell your own story and own your narrative, they will tell your story for you and say that you liked it. I'm paraphrasing a quote that's really well known uh, with that statement. But this idea here is that we have to control the narrative. We have to be in the, in the room or, or at the table when decisions are being made about media representation, which is why I'm such a big fan of GLAAD. Um, and so there's still a lot of work left to be done. I have a podcast called Marking the Path, available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Uh, I am a journalist. I write stories for publications like Huff Post, Fox News Latino. Uh, I have a book out that's available on Amazon called Draft and the Perfect Collection of Writing. And so I tell these stories and do these things because it's important that people see themselves reflecting the media they consume. That's why, although I haven't seen every episode of Pose, it was so groundbreaking that Sean FX, because it showed black and brown trans women 
for the first time in a prominent way in the media in, in a way that is con, con digestible and consumable um, that wasn't relying heavily on stereotypes or wasn't relying heavily on their death per se, but how they lived, how they thrived. And, how, and, and so I think that's really important. And so I think that we have a lot of work to do to change perceptions, right? And one of the things that we can start doing is being honest about our shortcomings. You know, I work very hard um, to get to where I'm at. And while I am not as poor as I was when I was growing up, I consider myself working poor. That means that I am still, like many Americans, many straight Americans and queer Americans and trans mm -hmm. Americans, I lived often paycheck to paycheck. And I happened to work really hard to establish myself as a speaker, an activist, a writer, a storyteller. Um, but that doesn't negate the fact that off the, off the cuff, I was at a disadvantage in this life. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I appreciate that you brought up Pose, especially because I think one of the interesting things was not just what it did it give us stories that a lot of people hadn't heard, not did it just use actors actually from the community, but it actually talked about larger issues, some of the socioeconomic issues and what that meant for people's lives, how their lives had to look um, and what people did to survive. And it told stories that I think a lot of people didn't know, but you actually just got us up to the next question and the next thing that I wanna talk about, and which is this impact of no generational wealth. And you know, we did a little bit of um, research coming into today's um, uh, show and I wanted to share a couple of these statistics with people who are watching. So um, when it comes to education, um, it, we found that um, according to the Point Foundation, 83% of LGBTQ students pay solely by themselves for their post-secondary education. And that's in contrast to 53% of students who are not LGBTQ. When it comes to homelessness, we know that between 20 and 45% of homeless youth are LGBTQ identified. That's of course from the Williams uh, Institute. And when it comes to home ownership, so as we talk about people mm -hmm. maturing, getting a little bit older, establishing themselves, only 49% of LGBTQ people are homeowners, as opposed to 65% of their straight and cis counterparts. So Mark, when you look at your own experience, can you see places where this lack of generational wealth um, has had an impact on you? And what did that impact look like? Yeah, I mean, I can talk about from a real life, real experience, right? And so I don't have a safety net. Like yeah. many um, of my straight counterparts or uh, white, gay, lesbian, queer, trans people, I don't have a safety net. So if I were to fall, if I were to crumble, if I were to find myself in a hard spot, while well, I have a supportive community, a chosen family members who help and support me, um, I am often the safety net for my relatives who need support. I'm yeah. the one to go to because, oh, you're speaking at Harvard or you have a book or you're doing all these things. You must have money. And I'm just like, I'm an artist. Like, <laughs> what artist in America has money, you know? <laughs> I mean, I'm aspiring to live well and to and not, I don't want to be a millionaire. I want to live comfortably, right? And I, I want to do so with integrity. And so I often say that um, because I am the safety net for my relatives who are in my immediate family, I recognize that because of that, I feel an enormous amount of pressure to succeed. Failure is not an option for me because yeah. when I fail, if and when I fail, which failure is inevitable, but when I fail at something, right, it means I'm putting other people in my family at risk for not being able to succeed in life. I'm the first one in my immediate family to graduate high school, first one to graduate college, and my niece, who I'm very proud of, Jalen, just started her freshman year at William Patterson University, my alma mater. And I say that proudly because she's a second generation college student, um, but she's really blazing her own path. And I think that her path is possible because I did the hard work of being the first. And yeah. so we need more of that. We need families to understand that for LGBTQ youth of color, especially, being the first to go to college, I had to pay my own way through college. I had to support myself, feed myself. I had no support from my immediate family in that regard. And, and not because they didn't want to, because I was queer or gay or whatever, it's because they didn't have the resources. Yeah. You know? And I think one of the biggest things that we do that's detrimental to all people in this country is that we don't teach financial literacy. Yeah. We don't teach financial literacy. And so my friends have been teaching me about it who are experts or who read about it. They bought me a book. I'm excited to start reading it. And so it's time to build our knowledge gap, to close the knowledge gap about what it means to be financially independent and financially literate. And do you so, yeah, think, one of the things I deal with. Yeah, do you think that solving this is more a question of economic justice or social justice? Or is it kind of a combination of both? Are we going to have to have those two 
um, conversations at the same time. I don't think you can have economic justice without social justice. Exactly. Right? I don't think you can have it. I don't think it's possible because when we talk about the, you know, economic disparities, the the Jim Crow, the segregation, the the separate but equal, you know, like that wasn't equal. That wasn't equality, right? Um, the fact that women make less money than their male counterparts for the same amount of work. Um, the fact that black women are paid 62, 62 cents per dollar of the white man. The fact that trans women make less money and are less prepared economically because of the transgender identity. And so, you know, I want to just mention that and mention that while the gender not conforming person myself, as someone who falls on the gender not conforming trans GNC spectrum, I am very much aware of my male privilege and how my access to education has propelled me forward in life. And yet, and still, there is no economic justice without social justice. And so we have to disrupt the systems that are in place that are preventing people from having equal pay and equal access. And so that's a really important thing. And I talk about that all the time with college students about how to break barriers and blaze their own path. And so I think that you can't talk about economics without talking about social justice because it is a justice issue. And I, I have to applaud you for mentioning um, the wage gap. It's an issue that I worked on for a really long time. And it really frustrates me. A lot of people still don't realize women are getting paid less than men on balance. And as you look at women of color, those numbers get worse with every single step that you take. I think it's only when we have other people talking about it, when everyone's talking about it, not just people who identify as women, that we're actually going to raise some awareness on this. I think there's just such a huge gap between what people think is happening out there and what's actually happening out there. And I think it's lived experiences like yours that help people see this. So you mentioned something um, that actually brings us right into our third question for today's conversation, which is about what do we do next? Um, you mentioned your friends had given you um, a book on personal finance and you had started delving into that, but you have certainly had to figure out a lot of this on your own. I mean, you have started your own dance company, you have started all different kinds of programs you certainly have figured out much of many of the steps that need to happen. So what do you think are some of the suggestions that you would provide um, to people who maybe younger queer people or queer people who haven't really taken up this issue before um, in terms of becoming more aware of this, becoming more financially liter literate? What were the things you had to do to make it work? Um, I had to surround, my people, surround myself with people who not only accepted who I was, embraced who I was and saw my potential. And then I have to learn to embrace myself fully so I can unlock my potential for success. That was the premise of my TEDx talk, embracing yourself, embracing your potential. And so what I always tell young people, especially um, young queer folks of color or young trans folks of color is embrace yourself. Know that it is possible for you to succeed, succeed. Even if your success doesn't look like those who came before you. And even if it doesn't look like those who are coming after you, your success is your, is your own to claim, but it doesn't mean you won't go through barriers or obstacles, right? As 17 years old, I felt with, I dealt with ageism, racism. So I live by a train, happens to be passing as I talk to you. Um, but I, I, I dealt with reverse ageism because I was so young. And so the older white people who were in charge of physically integrated dance didn't take me seriously. They thought, what does he know? He's 17. And so I had to keep pushing back on that and saying, I have my lived experience. I have the passion for this work. I'm going to educate myself. I always tell people, young people that, educate yourself, become aware, and really think about the ways that you can support one another in this journey. You know, there's a reason why we queer people have chosen family members. It's our chosen family members that often lead us through the darkest moments of our lives. It, are, it is those people who, who, who keep us going when our, when our immediate blood relatives disown us. And so I want people to educate themselves, read books, watch videos on YouTube, Google things, Talk to people who are more experienced than you, who are older than you, who have different life experiences than you. And know that just because you don't go to college doesn't mean you can't have a successful life. I think people have to think about vocational schools, um, which are often much cheaper than colleges and universities. Uh, if your pathway or your career path doesn't require a four-year degree, consider the importance of having a vocational training, right? And so there's many different pathways to success. What is your pathway? What is going to be the trail that you blaze that no one else can and own that. Do you think, um, do you think that some of uh, the values that you had as somebody who was first generation doing this, like that value of really having to do hard work, that that played prominently in who you are today? Cause I mean, you seem 
absolutely positively driven. It looks like nothing would get in your way. Do you attribute some of that to what you were taught at home or is it skills that you learned along the way? Both. It's, you know, my mother's one of the most resilient people I've ever met. As a single mother of two children living below the poverty threshold, um, she had to figure out how to provide for two of her children as a single mother in a very expensive state of New Jersey. So, <laughs> you know, and, and she did the best she could with the resources and the opportunities and the training that she had. Right, because she didn't come from a wealth of education or background or, or a wealth, right? So, you know, that generational poverty cycle mm-hmm. and trauma was passed down to us. Yeah. But I made a choice very early on in my life that I said, I will not continue this cycle. I will break this generational cycle of lack of education or lack of access to education. I will break this cycle of poverty. I will break this cycle of, of shame that says I am not worthy of good enough of having what I really desire. And so I know how to look a million bucks look shopping at Target. I love Target, I'm a Targetista, right? It's about <laughs> learning how to embrace your truth, your potential and living within your means. And that's okay. And some days I struggle with that and some days I don't. And, and you know, and when I stumble, I extend grace to myself and say, tomorrow's another day to get it right. I love that. I, I love that so much. And I think it is a journey, learning about your own economics, your own finance, and how to navigate this, because we do have unique challenges um, based on identity. And I think as we look at our multiple identities, those could pose so many challenges, but in some ways pose opportunities. I love that you mentioned chosen family and the role that that can play in this too, and, and, and in trying to understand and learn what needs to happen. Um, so I want to ask a really important question is, which is what are you doing? What are you working on? And how can people find out more about you? Because you're pretty fabulous. And I want to make sure people are connecting with you. Yeah, I would love that. So you can go to my website, www.mark, M-A-R-K, Travis, T-R-A-V-I-S, Rivera, R-I-V-E-R-A dot com. You can check out my podcast, Marking the Path on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Um, you can read my book, Drafts, an Imperfect Collection of Writing, available on Amazon. Um, if you don't shop at Amazon, I apologize. Um, <laughs> I am working on my second book, my second collection called Yearning. Um, and it's all about yearning for fatherly love, yearning for acceptance, yearning for romantic love, and then yearning for self-love. And the journey it took me on to get to this point in my life. I'm 30 years old, and it took me a long time and a lot of therapy to get to this point of realizing yearning to fill a void that is unfillable. Um, I'm, I have speaking engagements coming up. I'm giving a keynote as the opening keynote speaker for William Patterson University's LGBTQ History Month in October. Uh, I'm doing more virtual talks um, in, in the coming weeks. And people can follow me on Instagram and Twitter uh, at Mark Trav, T-R-A-V, Rivera, same handle on Instagram and Twitter. And yeah, I'm busy writing grants and and, Season three of my podcast is coming out. Um, my final, the final season of my podcast is coming out um, in September uh, this month, and I'm working on a new project. I can't talk too much about yet. We're in pre-production, um, but it's going to be a vodcast of some sort, and it's going to be kicked off at some point in 2022. Oh, that is so. So basically, you're just sitting around, not doing a whole lot of stuff, relaxing, chilling, too much, too much. online shopping. And I'm moving. I'm moving to Atlanta. So I'm relocating from California to Atlanta, returning to the East Coast um, in a few weeks. So yeah, lots of stuff is going on, but I'm so excited for this season in my life. I, I think turning 30 in May has really put me into hyper gear and it has made me realize it is now or never. Life expectancy for those who are trans or gender non-conforming, who are people of color, are anywhere between 35 to 40. And so I know that because of that, of that stark reality, I work hard each and every day because I don't know where my last breath might be. What a way to think about things. Yeah. What a way to think about things and what a way to think about things that so many people never will. Yeah. Um, and I think that says a lot. I think you're amazing, Mark. I think oh. just, I, I have to say, if you haven't been to Mark's website, you should definitely check it out. There is so much good stuff up there. I was really excited about meeting you after being there. Um, and I think you are really sending, creating a model for people of, what this can look like, what success can look like, especially when people don't expect success to come out of certain areas and certain people. And there's a million demographics that says that we shouldn't succeed and you are succeeding. Um, and I think that that is phenomenal. I mean, what what a model of hope you're creating for somebody. Somebody may be watching you right now and realizing you're the one person who looks like them. Oh, thank you. That's, you know, I, uh, Laverne Cox told me, not me personally, we're not friends, but she said at a conference I was at, <laughs> she said, um, 
I want to be a possibility model. Yes. And I'm getting emotional. I apologize. Um, I don't want to be a role model for anyone because I'm imperfect. I'm human. I'm imperfect. I make mistakes. I'm going to fail. What I hope to serve or hope to be is a possibility model that when someone looks at me, not only do they see themselves reflected, but they see the possibility of who they can become. Um, so that puts me from falling off the pedestal and it puts me on being grounded in who I am and why I do this work. So thank you, P-Flag National. Thank you, Jean Marie, for having me and allowing me to be a guest on your show. Thank you so much. And please, 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 when whatever your new project that you couldn't tell us that much about um, happens, <laughs> you have to make sure you email so we can have you back to talk about it. How about that? Yeah, yes? I would love that. I would love that. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much, Mark. We will see you really soon. Um, and now we are actually going to do something a little bit different. Oh, that was such a good interview. Um, we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what's happening at PFLAG right now, because we have a lot of great stuff coming on. And to do that, I have the communications director who's going to communicate it all to us. Hello, Liz Owen. Hello, Jean Marie. How are you? I am doing well. That was such a good interview. Did you get that to see it? That was amazing. I did the whole thing. I was sitting here back in the, in the green room. The yeah. green room. <laughs> I feel lazy is how I feel. I know, I know. I'm like, I'm a very unaccomplished person. Yes. So Liz, we have so many good things coming up. And we were talking about, they kind of fit into our little three buckets of work of support, education, and advocacy. So could you tell us a little bit about some of the really cool support stuff that PFLAG is rolling out in the next couple of months? Yes, we have a lot going on here. So um, everyone, or hopefully everyone knows about PFLAG's program, PFLAG Connects, which we launched the first week of April of 2020, uh, when the pandemic hit, and it's been wildly successful with hundreds of our chapters holding these meetings. And now we're going to move it to a national, uh, a national level. So we've announced a program called PFLAG Connects Communities. That's part of PFLAG, and it's a space for parents and families and LGBTQ plus people from historically marginalized communities to get the support that they need. Um, it's also going to offer ways to learn about more resources designed for those specific community needs. So you can learn about that. Uh, it's on the screen, pflag.org slash pflag connect slash communities. And uh, our first meeting next month is for uh, Latinx, Latino families. So hopefully people will log on to learn more. That's um, not it. There's more. That is not all, but wait, <laughs> there's more. Um, so a number of months ago during AAPI Heritage Month, we premiered this gorgeous film by a short film by filmmaker Stephanie Tran called A Place to Call Home, which featured uh, four AAPI uh, moms and their LGBTQ kids. And the film got tons of attention and great press. And it's been a really great source of support for a lot of people. Um, well, I'm happy to share that we're going to be re-releasing that film uh, with seven newly captioned versions so that we can reach a wider audience. It's going to be available captioned in Korean, in both simplified and traditional Chinese, in Japanese, in Tagalog, in Vietnamese, and in Hindi. Um, and we will be releasing those uh, pretty soon, and they will all live on that, uh, at that, on that page you see the link for there. Um, and then finally, also in the support space, um, we are going to be releasing a new short publication specifically for grandparents uh, who have a grandchild who've come out. Um, we're really honored to partner with our friends at Sage on this project, and we're really grateful to our longtime friend, Dira Abbey, who's been a total champion for PFLAG for actual decades. Um, who wrote the forward for us for this book. So it's going to launch on Grandparents' Day, which this year is on September 12th. And you'll be able to find it both in English and eventually very soon after in Spanish uh, at pflag.org slash publication. And it's so good. I was so excited when I read it. I'm really excited about it coming up. Now, education, which you know is like where I get really excited. Um, we have our convention coming up. So can you give people a quick snapshot of what's happening with that? Absolutely. So um, your team has been hard at work on getting our sessions together. It's going to be October 22nd through 24th. Um, it's called We Are the Change, is the PFLAG, uh, the PFLAG National Convention. You can uh, learn more at the link that's there. And usually, you know, we're in person for three days with dozens and dozens of sessions. But we're looking at this virtual version. It is virtual this year as an opportunity, a creative opportunity to select 
a number of subjects and do a deeper dive than normally we can do when there are so many sessions. So it's a new way of doing it, but it's a good, safe, and extremely collaborative and creative way of experiencing uh, We Are the Change. So I think we'll do that. It's going to be fun. And we have to go really fast on this one. But advocacy, um, we have a couple of teams going. So tell people about that. I'll make it real quick. So we're asking everyone who is watching right now to commit to taking one weekly action a week to ensure equality for everyone everywhere at all times. Call your senators twice, a week. well, once a week. You can join Team Tuesday or Team Thursday and you'll get updates from us, a little reminder to call, to email, to send a letter, to tweet. And you can learn more there, pflag.org slash fight for number four, equality. <sighs> Lots of stuff happening. Got it all in. Got it all in. Thank you, Liz. I knew you could do it. I knew you could do it, Mistress of Communications. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. And we are a little bit over. I'm so sorry, but we had a lot of good stuff to tell you about this week. Um, we will be back next week with another great show. It'll be a really fun one. Um, as we remind you every single week, we want you to run fast, laugh hard, and most of all, be kind. And actually, most of all, if you haven't been vaccinated, please go get yourself vaccinated. Um, we have got to beat this thing. It is the only way we're going to do it. And wear your mask when you're told to, like a nice, kind person. Um, we will see you next week on Something to Talk About Live. Have a great week, everybody. Bye.